Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name's Tim. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Tim. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. I, I, I was, um, I'm, I'm on my way to Galveston. Uh, and don't ask why I'm coming via Tucson to go to Galveston, but that's what's happening. Uh, I don't know why I'm here, but I am here. So I'm making the most of it, which is why I was talking to Rob about what, what we could do to carry the message. Um, there's a story in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, where this woman uh, uh, grabs a drunk off the street uh, who's just having a horrible time and, and tells him her story about getting sober in Alcoholics Anonymous. And a friend of mine commented, she must have been pretty thirsty that day <laughs> to realize that she needed to carry the message to stay alive. So maybe what is going on here is I need to be carrying the message so that I stay alive today. Uh, and if you benefit from, from me carrying a message, that's great, but I'll stay sober. And that's good, that's good, enough. That's good enough for me. Um, we are gonna go through the steps, but I need to talk a little bit just about who I am and how I got here so that you've got some kind of context for this. So let's do some basic facts. I'm in my 50s. Um, I got sober when I was 21 in uh, 1993. Uh, uh, my home group is group 12 in San Antonio in Texas. Uh, that's online, which is why my home group is in San Antonio in Texas and not in London where I live. Those, these are some basic facts. All of those things are true for now. Um, what else? I, I first decided to give up alcohol forever in 1990, which is three years before I actually gave up alcohol forever. This tells you a little bit about alcoholism. The decision to give up alcohol forever does not flow through into giving up alcohol forever unless something else happens. Um, I know it's very fashionable in AA to talk a lot about your childhood. Uh, I'm not going to. Uh, I mean, I think it's interesting, but I don't think it's interesting to anyone else particularly. And also, I'll say a few things about mm -hmm. it. First thing, um, uh, my family is screwed on every imaginable level. Uh, uh, each generation has its own difficulties. But I'm an alcoholic. My brother was an alcoholic. I have a nephew who needs to be in recovery and now is in recovery. There might be a few other people that need to be in recovery and aren't yet in recovery. Everyone else is just screwed. They're not alcoholics. They're not addicts. We're, it is not the family I grew up in which made me an alcoholic or everyone in my family would be an alcoholic. There's a huge amount of mental illness. Uh, both my parents were hospitalized, uh, uh, both of them for a long time because of mental illness. One as a child, uh, uh, one my father in his 20s. Um, but one of my sisters found some knitting, some knitting in a cupboard uh, uh, and asked her mother, who was not my mother, it's a, compli <laughs> it's a complicated family, but you know, <laughs> What does brother and sister mean? It's not straightforward. Anyway, uh, my sister found the knitting and uh, uh, said to her mother, well, who is, is that? She said, oh, it's your father's. He went somewhere for a while and that's what they taught him. Um, so, you know, people have had a lot of problems. Uh, I'm an alcoholic. My brother was an alcoholic. My nephew uh, is in recovery as well. Uh, I think uh, the, the messed up family may have accelerated my alcoholism, but I don't think it caused it. Because when I had 
a drink, everything changed. I was suicidal when I was growing up. I remember at the age of 11, deciding that the world had nothing to offer. I wasn't remotely interested in the world. I turned my back to it and said, I, I guess I'll just wait until I die. When my parents die, I can legitimately commit suicide because there is no one particular to hurt then. Uh, so I'll just wait until they're dead and then I can join them. And that was the very conscious thinking at the age of 11. I found drink. I thought, this is all right. I can do this for, if, if I can survive with alcohol, well, that will, let's spin this out for a few more years. Alcohol had a different effect on me than it did on my family. Um, when I have a drink, a very simple thing happens. I want another one. That's all. I don't know how much it even fixed me. Often, it, even in my first year of drinking, I would get drunk and it's like my, my mind could either turn left and I'd get happy and jolly and vivacious and full of fun or it would turn right and it would go into darkness and mischief and I, I was someone that I, I did not like to sit still when I was drinking I get curious as to what was going on out there and I would go out there away from the people I was with you see I did not drink to connect to other people I would be with people, I would have a few drinks, and I'd think, who, who are these people? Why bother? I want, there's something I'm missing out there. Let's go and look for it. So I'd say, I'll be back in a couple of minutes, and I wouldn't be back in a couple of minutes. I was just gone. And I would, I would engage strangers, cause trouble, um, pretend to be people I wasn't put on accents. This accent right now is my actual accent. That <laughs> through a lot of my drinking, if you met me, the accent that I would have would not be my actual accent because I enjoyed fun and excitement and lying and storytelling and getting into trouble and getting into fights. I'm not a fighter. I just enjoyed being, I just enjoyed the excitement. Alcohol had a different effect on me, completely separately from uh, what it did for me. I just wanted more and more and more. Uh, a friend of mine, my friend James, who this time is sober 20 years, um, he describes it, it, in England, uh, we have these, these little chocolate things called Maltesers. Any British people online who are listening to this will know exactly what Maltesers are. They're these little chocolate balls with a kind of honeycomb thing inside. They're delicious. And I haven't been to the cinema in a long time, but in England, in cinemas, uh, you would always buy Maltesers on the way in. You buy this little box, you open up the lid full of these little beautiful little chocolate balls full of honeycomb. Um, my friend James describes how when he's going to the cinema, he looks forward all day to his box of Maltesers. He's thinking about his box of Maltesers. He gets to the cinema excited. He buys his box of Maltesers. He goes and sits in the dark on his own, watching the trailers, watching the adverts, eating the Maltesers, and they are gone by the time the trailers are even over. He's just wolfed a lot of them. And then he forgets all about the Maltesers and watches the film. He was craving, in the ordinary sense, in the language, he was craving Maltesers all day. But he ate Maltesers and eating Maltesers satisfied his craving. He was now done. He did not <laughs> go back into the lobby, buy a second box of Maltesers, come back, eat that, go out into the lobby, leave the cinema and hunt around the city of Bristol looking for ever more Maltesers. Um, alcohol does a different thing and what alcohol does to me is if I want alcohol and I give me alcohol that amplifies the desire for alcohol it does not satisfy it if it's a hot day and I want a glass of water 
and I drink the glass of water, I now don't, I don't need another glass of water because I'm done. It's satisfied the desire. And there are a couple of other things like that. If you've ever been bitten by a mosquito and you realize it itches, by the time you're a grown up, if you have any sense, you realize don't scratch the itch of the mosquito bite because it will make the itch worse. And that's what alcohol was like for me. If I scratch the itch, it makes it worse. And it does not let go until... I was going to tell my story in this one, but I'm going straight into step one. So sorry about that. If you, if you want me to stick to the schedule, I'm not going to. Um, I'm going to go into step one on this. My friend Tom describes it very well. And I often quote other people because if I hear someone describe it well, I'm just gonna go with that description because it works for me and I'm gonna pass it on to you. I don't know if he made it up or if he got it from someone else, but he said, alcoholism is a lot like dancing with a gorilla. You're not done dancing until the gorilla is done dancing. Except in the original story, it's not dancing, it's dating. Except in the original story, it's not dating. When the gorilla is done, it will let go. You may or may not still be alive at this point. And I know that if I drank again, I literally might never stop. Um, people talk about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. So in the story by Robert Louis Stevenson, Dr. Jekyll is this doctor who discovers, who he, he concocts this potion that enables him to become this monster, Mr. Hyde, through which he acts out all the things he wants to act out, but can't as a respectable, normal person. Um, he becomes Mr. Hyde to let the devil out. But Mr. Hyde does not want to turn back into Dr. Jekyll. When I go back into a drinking life, as I did repeatedly between 1990 and 1993, when I go back into that, I literally forget that I was sober. So I was sober for three months in 1990, I was sober for three months in 1991 because I really, really needed to be sober. I had catastrophic nervous breakdowns. Um, I burned everything. There wasn't much to begin with, but what there was, I burned to the ground. Uh, night after night, making myself sick, making myself ill, getting into trouble with people, not being able to function the next day, hemorrhaging money, which wasn't even mine. Um, upsetting everyone in my life thinking okay enough is enough I need to sort this out and I'm sober three months and I start again because we're September September was a very tricky month for me <laughs> it's obviously September's fault now uh I would start drinking and the memory the no memory of the fact that for those three months everything was getting better because you, you stop being physically sick, you can show up for stuff, you can earn money, you apologize to people and it's credible because you're no longer dribbling. Um, I started to, to build relationships with people again and yet I would start drinking again and there's a line in the book where it says to him the alcoholic life is the only normal one and when I go back into the drinking world the only thing I can imagine is just carrying on drinking forever. And it seems like this idea of there being a sober version of me fades until it's not there. I don't give up alcohol when I'm drinking. I don't give it up. I remember when I was very new in AA in 1993, um, I said very proudly after my last slip, um, which was 24th of July, 1993, I said to Doug, who is my sponsor, I think I finally give an alcohol up. And he said, Princess, it gave you up. So if I were to drink again today, I can't guarantee that I would ever come back. Um, I've been talking about step one to a couple of sponsees recently. So this is all incredibly fresh in my mind. Every time I take someone through step one, it brings the whole thing, brings the whole thing back. Um, I had evidence from the late 1980s, if anyone remembers the late 1980s. I have evidence from the late 1980s. I should not drink. 
And yet for four or five years after the evidence was there that I should, n I should not go anywhere near alcohol, the decision was not made to give up alcohol forever. So I don't think I make the decision to give up. I think the decision forms within me. It's beyond my will. I suddenly discover myself willing and able to do what people in AA tell me to do. But I can't bring that about myself. And what people said to me is, if you've discovered yourself sober and able to do at least some of the things that people are asking you to do, boy, do you want to put your back into that? Because this may be your last chance. And when I got sober in AA in London in 1993, there were five of us who were under 25 and sober in London, a city of what, seven, eight million people. It's changed now. Lots of you go to any group in central London and there are a dozen people under 25 sober. But then it was very different. Almost everyone was 300 years old and Irish, which was great. That's not a criticism. I'm just reporting what it was like so there were five of us who people would have nicknames like Irish John and you're like you're gonna have to narrow it down more than Irish Irish John from Kilburn Kilburn is a very Irish area of London uh and so no 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 Irish John from Kilburn I know at least eight people who fit fit that description okay Irish John from Kilburn with the white hair and the red face, still not narrowing it down. Irish John from Kilburn, white hair, red face, really angry. I mean, you, you, you still no, we've now, we've now got two, it could be. Um, so with the five of us who were like, who, who, who did not fit into this deal, uh, we stuck very close to each other. And um, one of them, one of us, Fred, 21 year old ballet dancer, uh, didn't turn up at the meeting one day and uh, we went round to the hospital where he lived the next day and they said he died, he drank, he took some drugs, he overdosed, he was dead. Uh, another of us started drinking again after about a year and a half in 1995. Uh, this is someone who I, I we spoke on the phone for an hour or two uh, uh, every night for the first couple of years. He started drinking again and it's what uh, 27 years later, he's still drinking, periodically tries to come back into AA, gets a few months, goes out again. And it's like he's on the other side of thick glass. He's tapping the glass on his side. We're tapping the glass on our side, but we can't make the glass shatter. So when I have a drink, I'm going to want another drink and I become a different person, and that different person does not want to get sober. Sometimes people say, I drank because I liked how it made me feel. I don't know about you, I drank even when I did not like how it made me feel. So I've got to be very careful. There's stuff in the big book, which is very, very useful around ooh, page, page 20, 23, I think, where it says, all the reasons we give for drinking are alibis, they're excuses, which don't fully make sense. And I'll give you some examples. So, right, the first drink had a really major effect on how I felt. But when you've had uh, two pints of gin and you have another gin, someone just shuddered. <laughs> uh, if you have another gin, that's not going to substantially change how you feel. When I had two pints of gin, I did not say, well, how would I like to feel in about five minutes? Let's think this through. Well, I'm going to feel slightly, so I'm going to have an... No, there wasn't a... Th it's not a thinking process. I'm not thinking it through to work out why to have the 12th or the 14th or the 32nd drink or even the second drink. There might be some cognitive process, some mental process before the first. We'll come to that. But there isn't after that point. There's something else going on because it's not going to change how you feel after a couple of pints of gin. And even and it's worse than that. I remember being with some friends on a campsite up in the hills overlooking the city of Florence in Italy, having an amazing time. I was 19, 20. I was drunk. 
we were all drunk. I knew if I opened, the wine would come in these Tetra Pak, you know, cardboard boxes. I knew if I opened another one and glugged it down, I'd tip over into darkness, it would make it a horrible evening. I knew exactly what more alcohol would do, how it would make me feel. It would make me feel worse, and I did it. So I did not have the second, the 14th, the 32nd drink because of how it would make me feel. I had it because I'm an alcoholic. And I was at, I was at uh, an AA convention in Frankfurt in Germany a number of years ago, and they had the brilliant idea. The best speaker of that weekend was a non-alcoholic. He was the chief physician of the largest uh, mental hospital. Um, that's where they send alcoholics in Germany. Um, mental hospital, largest mental hospital in uh, the region of Hessen, which is a large region, Frankfurt in the middle. And this is someone who specialized in the treatment of alcoholics and addicts. And they got him to do the doctor's opinion, but not the doctor's opinion opinion the chapter from the big book the doctor's opinion being his opinion as a doctor in 2015 what is going on with alcoholics and he told us and he said there's a bit of your this is me reporting what he said as i remember it i'm not a doctor i'm just reporting but i got a good memory um he said in alcoholics there's a bit of your brain which is simply pro well, just in human beings there's a bit of your brain brain which is programmed to register every time something gives you a serious rush and then it records well, what did he do oh he had alcohol he had sex he had cocaine good right so what we need to do we need to send messages up to the control center to the control center at the front of the brain say do that again do it again do it again do it again that little bit of the brain is not it, it is not thinking it's not having thoughts like you and i have thoughts it's not conscious it's just programmed and there's a bit of my brain which simply remembers that alcohol gave me an amazing rush and a number of other neat things for which there are 12 step fellowships available gave me a neat rush. Great. And so periodically it's just going to say, do it again, do it again, do it again. And it sends it up to the frontal lobes, which uh, that's the decision making center, I'm told. Now, in a normal person, in a normal person, the decision making center, takes in information and impulses from all the different bits of the brain. So, well, no, 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 let's not just go and do that straight away. Let's think about this. And it thinks through the pros and the cons, the advantages, the disadvantages, the drawbacks, the benefits. It all gets thought through and then you go and decide to do something. But in, a, in an alcoholic, this relationship has broken down. So the little druggy bit of the brain sends the message up to the frontal lobes. The frontal lobes are half asleep in alcoholics. And the frontal lobes say, okay, you wanna go and have a drink? Let's go and have a drink, I don't care. It's not capable, the frontal lobes are not capable in an active alcoholic of thinking it through the bit of the brain which remembers what alcohol did is not connected uh to the bit of the brain that remembers the rush it's all disconnected and the frontal lobes have no control he said they did brain scans of active alcoholics normal folks and recovered alcoholics and they discovered in the active alcoholics and drug addicts the front bit of the brain normally in, in, the, in the brain scan, if there's stuff going on somewhere, it's lit up. In the frontal lobes of the active alcoholics and addicts, it was not lit up at the front, it was dimmed. In the normal folks, 
lit up. In the recovered alcoholics who are several years sober, lit up. So all of those reasons why I drank so much, my brain is broken. That was what this doctor said. And it makes sense of a whole load of things for which I cannot otherwise account. My brain was just broken. And then, he, then came the bad news. <laughs> he said, the bad news is your brain as an alcoholic is permanently altered. That circuitry, which allows the rush seeking, the thrill seeking bit, to send messages which convert immediately into action, drink, drugs, other stuff. That circuitry ain't going anywhere. Uh, it might have yellow and black tape, like you know, this police tape ac across a crime scene. The tape is there. That tape does not stop a vehicle. <laughs> if you drive your vehicle through the tape, you're through the other side of the tape. And he said, in, a, in an active alcoholic or an addict. It's like that vehicle, once it goes through the tape, is on a Formula One track. It's just gonna go round and round and round and round and round forever until, until it crashes or it runs out of fuel. But that's the, only, that's the only life you'll know when you start again. So your only, your only relief you can possibly get from this is never to have the first drink. Don't set it off. We haven't got to the bad news. Okay. The bad news is that periodically the thought of a drink will still occur to me. One of my favorite examples um, was uh, a few years ago, I was walking along the South Bank in London with a sponsee. I mean, how, how, how you, could, you can't get more sober than going for a walk with your sponsee talking about the 12 holy steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I saw someone, it was a muggy day, kind of warm and damp and, and uncomfortable. And I saw someone um, sitting there with a pint of beer outside a, a, a pub or whatever. Uh, with, with, you know, the glass beads of condensation starting to drip down. I hope I'm not triggering anyone by saying this. The glass beads of condensation dripping down the outside of the glass. And the thought occurred to me, I could grab that glass out of his hand and I could drink it and it would be in me before anyone realized what was going on. Just before Christmas, I was in, I was in, I'm not a fancy shopper, but I was in a fancy shop where they had all these Christmas goods. And one of the Christmas goods was this bottle, it, it, and gin was one of my drinks. Um, uh, they had this bottle of gin where it said, and I kid, I kid you not, sugar plum flavored gin. I don't even know what a sugar plum is. I know it's something to do with Christmas. There's the sugar plum fairy or whatever in the nutcracker. Uh, but but uh, now, when I was drinking, we did not have <laughs> uh, sh sugar plum flavored gin. We had our equivalent of ripple. You know, that was what I, <laughs> I drank some really rank stuff. But I mean, it looked, the bottle was pretty, had little Christmassy things on the outside. It was it was gin, so it was clear, an attractive drink, sweet, apparently, sugar plum. My thought was, what harm could this possibly do? <laughs> Why not? Um, so my my brain is going to want, is going to send up the signal to have a drink. Now, if I give in to it, the circuit is now complete and we're just going to go round and round and round so I've got to not have the first drink but the thought will occur to me to have the first drink um, now I'm going to be a little bit controversial here um, a lot of people say that there's a theory going around I think it came from outside AA 
but it's circulating within AA now that the reason people drink again is because of unhealed trauma. It's an idea. People talk about it a lot. Um, it's an outside idea, therefore I have no opinion on it. But I will contrast it with what it says in the book about why people have the first drink. And you'd think, you'd think that it's got to do with, oh, I don't know, being unhappy or something. And there is a, maybe there's a little bit of evidence of that in the book, but there's some, I'm going to read some bits from the book, which are very strange. Um, let me have a look. Let's see if I can remember page numbers. So there's this, there's this fellow on page 32. It says a man of 30 was doing a great deal of spree drinking. Um, he was very nervous in the morning after these bouts and quieted himself with more liquor. He was ambitious to succeed in business, but saw that he would get nowhere if he drank at all. Once he started, he had no control whatsoever. He made up his mind that until he had been successful in business and had retired, he would not, he would not, sorry, I've lost my touch. He would not touch another drop. An exceptional man, he remained bone dry for 25 years and retired at the age of 55 after a successful and happy business career. Then he fell victim to a belief a belief, not a feeling, a belief which practically every alcoholic has, that his long period of sobriety and self-discipline had qualified him to drink as other men. There is no mention of suffering. There's no mention of difficulties in his life. Nothing. What happens next? Out came his carpet slippers and a bottle. This is not someone who was unhappy dysfunctional he was not suffering from the so-called bedevilments on page 52 having trouble with personal relations prey to misery and depression he's had a successful and happy business career but he wants a drink it's curious um on page 26 27 certain american businessmen alcoholic um, goes and gets treated his physical and mental condition were unusually good uh, above all he believed he had acquired such a profound knowledge of the inner workings of his mind and its hidden springs that relapse was unthinkable nevertheless he was drunk in a short time no suffering no difficulties He's been treated literally by the best psychiatrist available, arguably, at the time. So he's, <laughs> whatever, whatever unhealed stuff was healed, but he drank. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to any AA meeting, but we're not a well lot. I mean, you go around, I mean, I mean no offence to anyone. I'm sure you're very nice, but where I go to meetings, people are jiggered, and I include myself in that. You know, I, I, I'm not very well wrapped on some days. You know, things are leaking out everywhere. I came to AA full of mental illness on top of alcoholism. They talk about being maladjusted to life. I didn't even know where life was to get adjusted to it. I was just in my own weird little bubble. Um, these characters they're describing are very unlike most people I meet in meetings. I'm going to give, give you an even better example of someone you will never meet in an actual AA meeting. Fred is partner in a well-known accounting firm. How many people at your home group are partners in well-known accounting firms? Uh, we're lucky to have a couple of people that work at Starbucks. You know, we're, they're the, they're the the success stories, we do not have people like this. His income is good. He has a fine home. I dislike him intensely already. Is happily married. Well, good for you. And the father of 
promising children of college age. He has so attractive a personality that he makes friends with everyone. That's not me. I've been at AA meetings where someone in trouble says, I really do not want to be coming to talk to you, but here I am. I have a problem and apparently you can help. I'm not someone with an attractive personality that people flock to talk to. My fr a friend and I, after a particular meeting, we go for fellowship and the seats next to us are always the last to go. Um, I, he has so attractive a personality that he makes friends with everyone. If ever there was a successful businessman and his friend, to all appearances, he is a stable, well-balanced individual. How many people here think that they are stable and well-balanced? Well, my hand ain't going up, um, yet he is alcoholic. Uh, so, so this is not someone who is deeply troubled. This is someone at the top end. Of the, this is the 1% financially, materially, and probably psychologically as well. And then you look at the day he relapsed. Physically, I felt fine. No indigestion. Uh, physically, I felt fine. Neither did I have any pressing problems or worries. My business came off well. I was pleased and knew my partners would be too. It was the end of a perfect day. As I crossed the threshold of the dining room, the thought came to mind that it would be nice to have a couple of cocktails with dinner. Note the wording not I thought it would be nice to have a couple of cocktails with dinner. The thought came to mind. He did not call it and then it came. It came of its own accord. The thought of a drink will occur to me, not because I go and get it, but because it occurs to me. I'm not in control of the thoughts that come into my mind. And people say, alcohol is a liar. Well, sometimes it is, but look at what he says. Uh, it would be nice to have a couple of cocktails with dinner. That was all, nothing more. The only thought in his head is a couple of cocktails with dinner would be nice. Let's see what happens next. I ordered a cocktail and my meal. Cocktail number one, note that. He said a couple of cocktails with dinner would be nice. He's just had the first cocktail. Then, then I ordered another co cocktail. Cocktail number two. He literally does the thing that, his alcoholism told him would be nice. It did not lie, it told him the truth. He, a couple of cocktails with dinner would be nice. He has two cocktails with dinner, they are nice. Then what happens? After dinner, I decided to take a walk. When I returned to the hotel, it struck me a highball would be fine before going to bed so I stepped into the bar and had one I remember having several more that night and plenty the next morning and then it all goes tits up as we say um what is going on here it's very simple the thought of a drink occurs to him and because he's obeying his own mind he has the drink to drink again, two things have got to happen. Number one, the thought of a drink must occur to me. If that doesn't happen, I can't drink. But it's going to happen. Uh, people differ on this. Some people say you have 10,000 thoughts a day or 30,000 thoughts a day, 50,000 thoughts a day. Let's agree we have a bunch of thoughts every day and there are many days. What are the chances? I'm never going to think of a drink. Nil. So the solution to alcoholism, sometimes people say, well, I'm sober today because the thought of a drink doesn't enter my mind. Well, that's lucky because it enters mine. And not because I'm messed up or a thousand other things. It's going to occur to me because you pull the one arm bandit 50,000 times a day. At some point, three pints of beer are going to appear. The problem problem is not the thought of a drink occurring to me. If you're messed up, it might come quicker. Fine. But it is not the reason the thought is there in the first place. The reason the thought is there in the first place is because there's a bit of my brain which is programmed to register every time in my life I've got a thrill out of something and just periodically say, that would be nice. That's all. I don't think it's got anything to do with mucked up childhood or anything like that, that might accelerate it. It's not the reason for it. It might occasion it, but it doesn't cause it. 
So the real problem is nothing to do with that. The real problem is what did Fred do? Fred had the thought, then Fred obeyed his own thinking. Let's look at Jim. Um, now, Jim is a bit more like normal folks. So he's a little bit messed up. He, he's not the easiest person to get on with. He's not doing badly, but he's not doing great. And there's a little story, page 36, where they describe how he has this, how he has this drink. It says, yet he got drunk again. We asked him to tell us exactly how it happened. This is his story. I came to work on Tuesday morning. I remember I felt irritated that I had to be a salesman for a concern I once owned. And people go, aha, he had a resentment. That's why he drank. Now, I don't know about you. On any given day, does anything ever irritate you? Stuff irritates me. But does that mean every time I'm irritated, I'm going to drink? I, I, it's just not true. You take anyone in an AA meeting and you say, how many times have you, have you been irritated today? Most people have been irritated, even if it's just for a few moments. There's going to have been something, someone driving a, just a tiny bit too carefully in front of you and you're irritated. Note that I use the word carefully, not slowly. Um, there's going to be a bunch of irritation and other human feelings. There's going to be a range of human feelings. Uh, I mean, if, if that was the reason he, he's, he drinks, what would a person in AA do when a tragedy happens or there's a real reversal of fortune or you lose your job or your house is foreclosed on? So it can't be turning on that. This is an example of not someone, this is not an example of someone who had a resentment, so we drank immediately. No, this is an example of normal folks having a normal day. And it's a very, very similar story to Fred. I won't read the whole thing, so, but, but listen to this wording. Suddenly the thought crossed my mind. It's not by accident it's phrased the same way. That if I were to put an ounce of whiskey in my milk, it couldn't hurt me on a full stomach. I ordered a whiskey and poured it into the milk. I vaguely sensed that I was not being any too smart, but felt reassured as I was taking the whiskey on a full stomach. And he has the drink. The experiment went so well that I ordered another whiskey and poured it into more milk. That didn't seem to bother me, so I tried another. If you've ever known anyone who relapsed, there is often a very disconcerting phenomenon that the fact they've relapsed doesn't bother them, but it makes everyone else around them a little bit uncomfortable. But it didn't bother him, so he's fine. Um, for me to relapse, two things must happen. The thought must occur to me, and then I must be obeying my own mind. Let's look at a contrast. Uh, Bill W. is, at this point in, in his story, maybe, maybe a few months sober um my wife and i abandoned ourselves with enthusiasm to the idea of helping alcoholics to a solution of their problems it was fortunate for my old business associates remained skeptical for a year and a half during which i found little work i was not too well at the time and was plagued by waves of self-pity and resentment. This sometimes nearly drove me back to drink, but I soon found that when all other measures failed, work with another alcoholic would save the day. So this is great because this tells me I don't have to be serene, pleasant and balanced in order to stay sober. I don't need to be worried about my emotional state. I need to be worried about something else. He obeys something other than his most recent impulse. He's living life on an entirely new basis, which is what can I do for others? How can I be useful to God by being useful to others? So his whole decision-making framework about how he gets through the day 
is completely different than Jim and Fred. Jim does what seems to him to be the best thing in that moment. Fred does what seems to him to be the best thing in that moment. Bill, by this point, is trained to follow the system, regardless of what he feels, what he thinks, what his impression is. And there's a situation later on where he actually describes uh, a near slip. He doesn't slip, but he nearly slips. Of course he couldn't drink, but why not sit hopefully at a table, a bottle of ginger ale before him? After all, had he not been sober six months now? Have you ever thought, I can go into the booze shop, I don't have to buy anything, it's a free country, isn't it? I can look around, it's not a crime to look at bottles of alcohol. And you know what? I can buy one and I don't have to drink it. Uh, there's no law against buying alcohol. Uh, just because I buy it does not mean I'm going to drink it. And then you get it home and you think, now I bought it, I might as well drink it. But the, the, there's no, I don't have to drink more than one bottle. I could just drink this one bottle. The way the reasoning slips and slides, listen to this. A bottle. Why not sit hopefully at the table, a bottle of ginger ale before him? I presume that's non-alcoholic ginger ale. So at this point, he's thinking, I'll go to the bar, but just have a soft drink. The next thought, after all, had he not been sober six months now, perhaps he could handle, say, three drinks no more. He suddenly shifted from having non-alcoholic ginger ale to having three drinks. He has not noticed that his mind has slipped from one thought to the other and that the thoughts are not following in a logical sequence. It's slipping and sliding. Perhaps he could handle, say, three drinks, no more. Fear gripped him. He was on thin ice. Now, I've worked with a lot of relapsers and slippers over the years. God bless them. I was one of them. And sometimes people hide behind powerlessness and say, well, I'm, 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 I'm powerless over alcohol, so that's why I slipped. Not like, what could I do about it? And there's some truth to that. Now, thin ice is a very interesting image here. If you've ever walked on ice, I used to live in Russia. That's a whole other. Let's have a day on that. Um, I, used to I used to live in Russia in the early 90s. And... I lived in St. Petersburg and the, 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 the lagoon or whatever it was, was, was frozen over in part. So you could go and walk, you could walk on the ice and then you'd start to feel it crack underneath you. You'd see cracks develop and you'd think, shit, I need to run back uh, to where the ice was thicker or directly onto the shore. Now, uh, there were people that actually fell through the ice occasionally. Uh, by the time you're falling through the ice, it's too late. There is nothing to grab hold of. You can't grab hold of slipper. Once you fall through, you've fallen through. So that's true. Uh, my experience of slipping between 1990 and 1993 is that as soon as the slip started, there was really nothing I could do. But thin ice, you can only fall through thin ice if you are on thin ice in the first place. If you're not on thin ice, you cannot fall through it. The decision that I have as an alcoholic is where am I going to live? On thin ice or on solid ground? If I live on thin ice, a moment will come where the ice cracks and I fall through and I powerlessly drink again but I am not powerless over whether or not I live on solid ground or thin ice. I'll come back to that in a minute, but I want to do the next bit here. Fear gripped him. I remember that. I remember thinking, oh God, it started again. It's stuck, we're, we're off. I'm gonna drink. It's only a matter of time. Terrified and wishing the thought hadn't occurred to me 
he was on thin ice. Again, it was the old insidious insanity, that first string. Now, the next thing that happens is very interesting. With a shiver, he turned away and walked down the lobby to the church directory. This is what we call in AA smart feet. He didn't reason himself out of this or emotion himself out of this. He turned and his feet moved him in another direction. He had a substitute and the substitute was not an, it wasn't an AA meeting. It wasn't even, get this, it wasn't even prayer or meditation. It wasn't insight timer. It wasn't a yoga class. It wasn't, dare I say, a therapy session. It wasn't any of those things. He turned and walked left foot, right foot, left. I've had to get out of drinking situations. Left foot, right foot, right. Little left foot, move forward. Right foot, move forward. Left foot, move forward. Just get the feet going in the right direction away from the danger. But towards something, he's not running away from alcohol. He is running towards something else. He walked down the lobby to the church directory. Now, he's not out of the woods yet. This is a very interesting bottom of 154 in case you're looking for the page. Um, he walked down the lobby to the church directory. What he's going to try and do is fine. It is not because he wants to go to church and get absolution or do whatever. Whatever pe I don't know what people do in churches. Whatever people do in churches, that was not what he was after. He wanted to find a clergyman who would know some alcoholics in town so he could find an alcoholic, grab them by the lapels and say, if I'm going to live, I need to try and carry a message to you about how I've been saved from an alcoholic death. If it helps you, great. That was his deal. Find an alcoholic. The church directory was the way he was going to find a pastor. Find a pastor. Find an alcoholic. Saved. Kushti. Fine. So that's what he's doing. But it's not plain sailing. Next line. Um, music and gay chatter still floated to him from the bar. His feelings are still back in the bar. That's where he wants to go. And this is where wanting and willing are two different things. He wants still to drink, but he is willing to take action and walk in the opposite direction. He's willing to do something other than what he wants. He is surrendered to a course of action. That's what willingness is. It's surrendered to a course of action, as Clancy would say. It's taking actions you don't believe in because the person who suggested them, suggested them is doing better than you. So he still wants to drink, but he starts to take the right actions. And then, but what about his responsibilities? His family and the men who would die because they would not know how to get well. Ah, yes, those other alcoholics. So have you noticed with Jim and Fred, when they're about to drink, the thought occurred to them, but thoughts are now occurring to him, which take him in the opposite direction after, after he takes the action. He takes the action first, and then these same thoughts start to occur to him. The, he says those alcoholics, there must be many such in this town. He would phone a clergyman. So he's made a decision about what action to take, which is to phone the clergyman. And then his sanity returned. He did not go and get his sanity. It returned to him. He did not become sane through a reasoning process or as an act of the will. He decided to do a physical thing which is to phone a clergyman and then his sanity returned his sanity returned and he thanked god so the order is very very different than you'd think it might be you'd think it might be well god's gonna save you uh, so when you feel like a drink just pray to god he didn't do that 
the contact with God came at the end of the chain, not the beginning of the chain. The beginning of the chain was action, which he trained himself to do. There's a very good group. If you're ever in Plymouth, in I know there are lots of Plymouths here, but there's one. There's the real Plymouth, which is in England. Um, there's a very good group there called Road to Recovery, um, and they talk about AA being like military training. And the way I'm given to understand a lot of military training works is you're so drilled into acting a particular way and obeying commands which come down the command chain that when you're in extreme danger under extreme pressure the training will kick in and you will automatically do the right thing without having to think it through it's not even a question you're just programmed you and my experience is that recovery the point of it is to program me to take the right actions at the right time even though my head is screwed, even though my emotions are screwed, even though I'm like, what program? God who? My feet are trained to do the right thing. So to sum up a little bit about the diagnosis of alcoholism is I think it's very, very simple. A bit of my brain simply wants to drink and will send the command, let's go and have a drink. If I'm in the habit of doing what occurs to me to do, if I'm in the habit of following my own instructions, I will have the first drink. When I have the first drink, an automated pattern is activated, which I will not be able to stop. If you start it, it's started, good luck. Of uh, someone I know in San Antonio who is uh, 65 years sober now talks about the AA program. You need to have a clear head. You need to be cleared of alcohol and maybe some other substances before this program has any effect. If someone is still in their addiction, we know of no program that can help them, which is a chilling idea. I want to go back briefly to this idea of the of alcoholism being like dancing with a gorilla. You're not done dancing until the gorilla is done dancing. Though I'm also a member of Al-Anon. Maybe the most shameful thing I'll admit today. I'm, now I'm a very proud. I'm a very proud member of Al-Anon. Um, one day at a time, we don't push people down the stairs, even if they deserve it. That's that's my very basic, simple approach to Al-Anon. Um, the Al-Anon, and some of you may have grown up in an alcoholic environment. Maybe some of you know a few alcoholics and addicts and occasionally get concerned on their behalf. When the alcoholic is putting my Al-Anon hat on, when the alcoholic is in the cage with the gorilla of alcoholism, what I will want to do, as my friend Tom so beautifully describes it, as an Al-Anon, I will get in there and try and dust and hoover and make nutritious meals and hang uh, uh, little cross-stitch samplers up on the wall with you know, beautiful inspirational sayings. I will leave AA literature lying around, hoping that the alcoholic in the middle of the Paso Doble with the gorilla is going to spot the AA literature, discover the error of their ways, say uh, no means no to the gorilla and the whole deal will be open. And you know what happens when you try to get between an alcoholic and the gorilla of alcoholism is you get your arms and legs yanked off and not just by the gorilla. When they're drinking again, friend of mine from texas says leave him lay where jesus flang him step over the body get on with your life there is nothing you can do to stop the process it's just going to go chugga, 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 until it hits the buffers when it hits the buffers you want to be the person that they can come to um, without fearing that you're going to say i told you so so 
at any given time, I know a bunch of people who are in a relapsed condition. And I show love and kindness and continue to be the person that hopefully, if they ever want to get sober, they will want to hang out with. I don't want to become the school mom with the thin blue pencil lips of judgment with the wagging bony finger of AA hanging over them like, like retribution. Uh, once people are in it, it is not their fault that they can't get out of it. And there's nothing more chilling than watching this happen in real time. It's slow and it's incredibly unpleasant. So the diagnosis, diagnose, how to diagnose yourself as an alcoholic. Let's keep this very simple and very brief. Um, I drank too much. What does too much mean? So much I had consequences that I deeply, profoundly regretted. That's how you know it's too much. Could I moderate? No. How do I know? I didn't moderate. If I could have, I would have. I didn't, so I couldn't. And I couldn't stop altogether. How do I know? I, I didn't. If you do something harmful to yourself several hundred or several thousand times in a row, there's some, if it's not alcoholism, what the hell is it, frankly? I'm, I'm sure all of you have burnt yourself on a hot dish. It happens a couple of times a year, you take something out of the oven, the oven glove is not on properly, you catch part of your wrist on the, on the side of the dish, whatever. Occasionally you'll burn yourself. If a person were to burn themselves on cooking dishes 365 days a year, there's, some, there's, there's a, a breakdown in the person's mental processes. So that's the diagnosis, the prognosis for alcoholism. So the prognosis is if you got it, then this is what's gonna happen. It's progressive, it's fatal, and it's incurable. It's gonna get worse as you get older. It will never be easier than this time. I would leave AA thinking, it's just too hard right now. I can't do this. It got harder and harder every time. This is literally the easiest it will ever be. So you, you might as well do it now because it won't be easier in two years time or five years time or 10 years time. Um, it's progressive, it's fatal, except it's fatal in a slow way for most people. Um, I, I can't remember if I said, because I said this earlier, it might've been on the phone to a friend or it might've been earlier in this talk, but it, it probably bears repeating either way. When I phoned up a woman called Sue in AA, whose nickname was Angry Sue. Um, you know that when, when their nickname is Angry and then the name, they probably talk a lot of sense and piss a lot of people off. Uh, that's how they got the name Angry so-and-so. Anyway, I said to her, for me to drink, is to die and she said if you're lucky and that was right um it's not often as quick as people think it's going to be and it does some very very it can be very very ugly physically and it's also incurable which means that uh the the circuit the brain circuitry of addiction is always going to be there in me so i can never drink or drug safely and the possibility of returning to drinking and drugging is always there so i need something more i need something else uh, uh, by the way for those of you who are a bit techy about the steps and want to understand something about unmanageability um it says we're on page 1559 um what does it say? We admitted we were powerless over alcohol. To me, I'm powerless over the first drink. In other words, if the thought occurs to me and I'm running my own life, I will have it. I'm powerless after that point. Powerless before, powerless after. Dash, that our lives have become unmanageable. 
friend of mine explained it this way. It's very good. He said, if you're a diabetic, you're powerless over your insulin production. Dash, your blood sugar is unmanageable. One is the cause, the other is the effect. If I'm not in charge of whether or not I have the first drink, and then I'm not in charge of how much I drink, and then I'm not in charge of what I say or do because I'm now drunk, I'm not in charge of the course of my life. Someone can say, can you turn up at this address at 9 a.m. next Monday? I say, sure, unless a little voice says, let's go and drink, in which case you can whistle for me turning up at 9 a.m. next Monday. Whether or not the thought crosses my mind to have a drink is in charge of my life. That's what's running the show. That's what's managing my life. And it talks in the book, 12 Steps and 12 Traditions. Uh, you see, our manageability is not mentioned in the book before page 59, and it doesn't get mentioned or explained later on, because to them it was so obvious what it meant that it didn't need explaining. If something's not explained, take it at its plain meaning. And I heard a, a public information talk a few years ago where it was, it was, you know, AA makes those public information videos. And as soon as they're made, they, they look like they were made 50 years ago. Like, like those, you know, those public information videos from the 1950s, the, the, the newsreel ones with the, the, the voiceover, the old fashioned voiceover. There's one they made in, in, in Great Britain many years ago, which was in a prison. And they had an actor who was playing the prisoner. Um, they had this 1950s voiceover. It said, this is Brian. Brian is an alcoholic. He's lost control of his drinking and thus his life. I thought, oh, that's step one. He's lost control of his drinking and thus his life. So there's no special abstract meaning of unmanageability. You're just not in charge anymore. It's in charge. Capiche? It's very, very straightforward. Um, um, and it describes it in the 12 and 12. You see, the reason I mention that is because they were struggling by the 1950s to convince people who were 19, 20, 21, 22, who hadn't burnt their lives to the ground because they hadn't developed a life to burn to the ground. And people in their 30s and 40s who maybe were married, had wives, children, houses. Well, how can I be an alcoholic? I I'm not on a park bench. I still have a job. I still have a 401k or whatever your pension things are called. Everything looks fine, except for the drinking. And they said, going back to our own drinking histories, histories, we realized before the onset of real difficulties, our drinking was no mere habit. It was indeed the beginning of a fatal progression. And what terrifies me about alcoholism is the idea of being trapped inside it and wanting to get out, but being unable to get out. And that is the ultimate convincer. There is only one answer to this, and it is what Bill did in chapter 11. He turned and walked in a different direction. What is the different direction? The different direction is the actions of Alcoholics Anonymous, which, yes, it's about God, but it's mostly about the actions. There are days, you ask me, do I believe in God? Two days out of three, yes. One day out of three, not so sure. But my actions are consistent. That keeps me in a system which, and the system keeps me sober. Behind that system is a higher power. Sometimes I'm very aware of it. Sometimes I'm not, it's like shortwave radio. It just depends which way the wind is blowing, frankly. Some people feel God's warm in Brace 24 hours a day. I don't, but I have a system for living which works and has kept me sober for almost 30 years. Should we have a break, Rob? I think we should have a break. So, uh, so Josh, if online you can um, uh, press uh, stop on the recording, and uh, folks, we're going to start again at, um, should we say, uh, five past 10? Five past 10, Josh. Okay.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.